So, um, I want to welcome everybody. Thank you all for being here. Uh, this is day two of Enrichment Week, and the opportunity here is to get the most leading edge people and um, content uh, to current cadets, future cadets, builders in the space, and um, you know, put these tools in your hand to start playing with it. Um, you know, as you heard, John and I were just quickly talking about. You know, this is all new. So the opportunity not only to use, but also to contribute to the development and exploration of use case and um, improve the technologies, is, it's all in our hands. And it's, you know, to a, a great extent, it's our responsibility as responsible stewards of this space to, to go ahead and dive in and struggle with it and build with it. So um, I want to introduce John. John is from Solana Foundation. He's the tech lead over there. And I will mute myself and, you know, turn it over to him. If you have questions as you go, just pop your hand and we'll get to those. And, you know, let's hate Ben. Thanks, John. Thanks, Jeff. Hey, everyone. Uh, as Jeff mentioned, my name is John. Uh, I lead up the engineering team here at the Solana Foundation. I've been in the space for, I think, uh, over a couple of years now. Um, been uh freelancing a bit working on nfts uh joined labs last year uh and then transitioned to solana foundation in the summer um typically spend a lot of time thinking about nfts but uh, more recently been thinking about uh, the kinds of technologies that will help bring um all of the things that we're building on solana uh to, um into the into the broader world and what that means is making sure that it can help support the kinds of products and experiences that we uh, expect to see uh, on the internet and something that um, you know we don't we don't need people to like have to pay for every single little thing that they do uh, on 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 chain. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and present my screen and just to make sure people can see this. I know it's an infinity mirror here. Uh, can folks see this uh, presentation? Yep. Awesome. So uh, today we're going to be talking about state compression for NFTs, um, and uh, it's important to kind of set the set the table a little bit here. What is state compression? What is what are NFTs, and and what exactly are we trying to solve here? So on Solana, NFTs are you can imagine them as tokens. Well, you don't need to imagine they are tokens uh, that represent digital assets. Right? Digital assets sometimes look like PFPs, but they could look like hotspots that could look like just pieces of state that folks own inside of their wallet. Um, and uh, up until now, uh, using the prototypical Metaplex sort of account structure for an NFT, uh, folks would have to spend about 0.012 SOL per NFT uh, to store it on chain. Now, this is typically fine in the case where you have something like a 10,000 piece collection um, where the minters typically take on this cost. And so for the person or creator that is um, uh, creating those assets, they don't really have to foot this. But as we think about more interesting experiences where the creator wants to facilitate that experience. So for example, they wanna airdrop NFTs to, to uh, uh, their holders, or maybe they wanna use those NFTs to represent. This gets really expensive. And so for the teams that we talk to, we think about games, uh, enterprises, um they are thinking about doing hundreds of thousands millions if not hundreds of millions of nfts to keep track of basically everything accomplishments uh, uh digital assets of any sort um and so they want to be able to facilitate that entire experience and in order to do so it was just really expensive and so folks would go to other chains or they just would um just try a different strategy altogether so you know, they were being limited by the, the, the cost structure of NFTs on Solana. Uh, but I'm happy to talk a little bit about state compression for NFTs, which uh, drastically changes uh, the landscape for the kinds of things that you can build on the Solana network. Um, I cannot see any chat stuff. So if some, something happens, just uh, let me know. Um, cool. So uh, with compression, um, we can drastically reduce the cost of minting NFTs. In fact, here's the here's the the tagline. You know, 100 million NFTs is about 50 soul, and I think we could probably drum up 50 soul amongst this group here. And you can see this comparison of the kinds of cost structures that this looks like. 
if we had to mint a hundred million NFTs on Solana, or even just a million NFTs on Solana, I don't know, even two weeks ago, this would cost 12,000 sol. That's just cost prohibitive. It's like impossible to, to jump up that much money for uh, a, a drop, even at the size of a million. That same 1 million drop on Ethereum costs about $7 million, which I don't have. Uh, and on Polygon, it's about 18,000. You can kind of see the, um, the kinds of costs that uh, 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 companies would have to, to, to bear. Uh, 1 million NFTs is just five sol, right? And, um, and even if we get up to the billions, um, uh, the hundred millions here, 50 soul, pretty incredible. If you get to the billions, this is about 500 soul. So we can actually express so many more things uh, on Solana as a result of using state compression. But uh, you don't have to believe me. You can hear it straight from the product builders themselves. So if you're familiar, familiar with Dialect, Dialect is a you know Web3 powered um, messaging platform. Um, and they're using state compression to uh, uh, to mint compressed NFTs for all of their user base. So they did this really cool thing where the stickers that you use within your chat are owned by you. And so people can really choose, pick and choose the kinds of uh, NFTs that they, they like to represent themselves. They can buy, sell, transfer, all of those uh, uh, sticker packs. Um, and they can also support creators uh, at the same time because with Web3, we can make sure that they're getting a cut of their royalties, all that sort of stuff. So Dialect was able to do their entire NFT sticker pack launch uh, built on top of compressed NFTs. Um, and they were able to do that with their users not having to have a single token of soul in their wallet. And I think that was a really incredible experience um, for first time users who just don't really understand digital assets just yet, but totally understand messaging apps and understand stickers. Same with Helium. So Helium, uh, if you don't know, is a Web3 powered, uh, well, they, they do a lot of things, but uh, they do like mobile hotspots, a decentralized mobile hotspot network. And um, with something like 900,000, if not a million, sorry, they have a million hotspots all around the world. They wanted a system to represent all of that state on Solana without having to break the bank. So they used, um, uh, state compression and compressed NFTs to represent every single one of their validator hotspots uh, on chain, which allows them to be able to, for example, uh, reward all of their validator uh, owners um, because there's this very small bit of states that we can use to uh, identify the wallets that own these particular hotspots. Um, and uh, and Drip. So uh, Drip is another really great Web3 product, uh, originally built by Solana Spaces, but this is a weekly airdrop uh, of NFTs to a mailing list. Um, and that might feel very, um, that might feel like, oh, this seems so easy. But if you think about the cost, they have something like 50,000 people on their uh, uh, mail li mailing list. And every week they're issuing, airdropping them free NFTs those costs uh, start to, to rack up quickly. So not only are they using compressed NFTs, but they can use compressed NFTs in really creative ways to be able to provide upgrades, to be able to provide um, small uh, adjustments to previous ones, to be able to issue them to many more people. I think they have something like 100,000 people on their mailing list now. So they're able to do this at little to no cost um, and definitely free to users, right? They, they don't, um, none of the people on this mail list have to pay for anything uh, related to Drip. Uh, com state compression for NFTs is a ecosystem effort. Uh, it's built with the efforts of folks from across the ecosystem. So uh, primarily the contracts were built in tandem with Metaplex and Solana Labs, uh, but we are, uh, uh, it, it has been a critical contribution from folks like RPCs, uh, like Helios, Simple Hash. Uh, Triton, Genesis Go, uh, products like Dialect, Helium, and Drip, and of course the service providers, the the like things that pull everything together. This is folks like Phantom, Backpack, Soulflare, and Crossmint. And each of these uh, uh, teams has provided some really interesting insights, contributions, or just ended up doing the integration um, for compressed NFTs. So uh, as developers, as folks that are learning the Solana sphere and understanding what it is that it's like to operate in the ecosystem, what do you need to know about compression NFTs? So first, it's actually a combination of two smart contracts. The bubblegum contract uh, 
which is uh, owned and maintained by Metaplex Foundation, uh, handles the verification and validation of the actual NFT itself. But the underlying data storage is taken care of by something called state compression, which is inside of the Solana program library. And this manages a generic concurrent Merkle tree on chain. Uh, I'll explain some of the words that I just uh, vomited at you. Uh, but important to know that there are two different contracts working in tandem. And this is because state compression itself is a generic data structure. It doesn't know much about NFTs. Bubblegum knows everything about NFTs. So um, if you're familiar with a Merkle tree, a Merkle tree is a data structure whereby we can represent this large, uh, in this case, we're using a balanced binary tree. And uh, we can take all of the information um, in the leaves, which is these green nodes on the bottom, hash them. And as we hash them on the way up, we can basically summarize it in a fingerprint. And this fingerprint hash is what ends up getting stored on chain in an account. And so whenever we need to make any checks or verifications to say, hey, is this data actually an NFT? Is it actually in this tree? Then we can always do the same thing where we provide paths, sibling paths uh, up this tree to be able to what we call, and we call those proofs. We provide those proofs, we validate it against the root, and we can then verify, hey, this program actually issued this particular um, piece of state. The leaves, all of these, and all of the information related to the hashes that are in the leaves of this Merkle tree are issued into the ledger. And this is actually a really key and unique part of um, state compression that you just can't do on other chains where in other chains, you might have to build an L2, you might have to build a side chain, you might have to build a roll up, you might have to build an entire different set of validators that handles all of the data related to um, this information. Uh, we can do it all on the L1, we can do all of this on Solana itself. So we can depend on the, uh, we can actually depend on the security and decentralization of Solana of the ledger, and of all the validator network that is participating in consensus. And so if you look at the actual, if you look at some of these instructions in Explorer, I know there's some scary unknown program, unknown instructions, but this data is actually capturing all of the information needed to um, represent the NFT. And so any number of RPCs can go in, reread all of these transactions from these blocks, reconstruct the tree. Um, and so there's no lock in here. There's no like centralization at any point, um, which is a really nice, uh, uh, it's a really nice property and something that we made sure to design into the actual algorithm. So for developers, the four steps that you're gonna need to know to uh, mint or create or manage uh, any set of compressed NFTs. Um, initialize the tree, mint, tr mint NFTs, read NFTs and transfer NFTs. I'm gonna go into each of these in a little bit more detail. So initializing the tree. So we talked a little bit about the Merkle tree, uh, but there are some programmatic configurations that are valuable to understand for uh, a Merkle tree on chain. So uh, the first and the most important one is the depth. Understanding um, how we can figure out what it is, uh, how many leaves or how many NFTs we can store in this particular tree. So um, since this is a balanced binary tree, we can just say two to the power of the depth gets us the capacity of the tree. So uh, if we want a billion NFTs, uh, two to the 30, I think I think two to 30 is the right number, uh, you want the capacity to be larger than the amount of NFTs that you want to store. Um, our trees are designed um, to uh, max out at a depth of uh, 30. I think a billion is a good round number, um, but also because you can create multiple trees. And so uh, uh, it actually makes sense to create multiple trees. Uh, we find that, you know, up to about depth 20 is, is, is a good, uh, is a good um, watermark for most folks. The buffer size is an interesting configuration. Basically, what is so unique about the Merkle tree contract uh, that we're using, the state compression contract, is that it provides the capability for concurrency. Now, what does that mean? So whenever we update a Merkle tree, um, when any of the leaves changes or we add a new leaf to a Merkle tree, one thing is one thing is a little bit frustrating, which is that the hashes all the way up to the root, and I'm gonna just gonna go back to this uh, visualization here. Whenever a new leaf gets added, all of the hashes uh, all the way up to the root all have to change. And so if I was adding a leaf over here and simultaneously attempting to update a leaf over here, the proofs that I need to use to update this leaf here would fail to validate against the root here. 
And that's because this addition over here changed the hack, right? So that, that's a problem. What we designed into the state compression uh, contract is the ability to do concurrency. And the way we do that is by, instead of holding just one root on chain, we actually hold a buffer of roots. And so this buffer size is the amount of roots that are uh, on chain. And what's really cool about that is that this is actually the number of uh, updates that you can take um, without updating your own proofs. And let me reword that because I think that was a little confusing. What that means is you can be, your proofs can be up to buffer size amount of changes out of date. And so we can actually have 64, for example, if your buffer size is 64, you can have 64 changes to the same tree using the same set of proofs and they will all validate within the same block. Um, and so this gives us that nice concurrency element um, and allows us to parallelize a lot of our um, uh, calls into the RPCs, uh, which gives us that nice slick uh, Solana experience that we're all uh, uh, used to. The third configuration is a little bit more complex. This one's called canopy height. And canopy height is uh, a mechanism to um, facilitate things like composability. Um, and the way that this works is that because, uh, I'm gonna go back to this diagram here around the Merkle trees, whenever you need to make an update, say that you're transferring an NFT, one of these leaves from one person to the other, every time you're making an update to the tree, you have to pass all the proofs that are needed to make this modification. Uh, but as you can imagine, if your tree is something like two to the 30 and you have 30 layers of, uh, uh, of proofs that you need to pass, uh, there is a thing called the transaction size limit on Solana. And so um, you actually won't be able to facilitate those kinds of transactions because you just don't have enough space to send over the wire. What the canopy does is the canopy actually stores some subsection of the tree on chain. And that way you don't need to uh, pass all of the proofs. You only need to pass the difference between the sort of your leaf and the top of the canopy. And as uh, and that way, you only need to send a very, very small amount of proofs over the wire. Cool. So uh, initializing a tree is pretty complex. Uh, fortunately, minting an, F an NFT is not. So if you're used to the Metaplex JavaScript SDK for minting NFTs, you'll be happy to see that uh, uh, creating an NFT, uh, a Metaplex NFT inside of a, a tree is just as easy as specifying which tree you're going to mint it into. Uh, everything else about the NFT is structurally identical to a Metaplex NFT. So the URI to some Rweave URL, uh, the JSON manifest, all that stuff is basically exactly the same. Um, creators, collections, all that works um, just as you might expect. The only difference here is that you need a date, a piece, uh, a tree in order to store in. And you need obviously the authority to, to be able to mint into that tree. But it's as simple as sending a transaction. And because of the cost structure of how these Merkle trees work, um, the cost of any individual NFT is uh, as small as the transaction itself. So, you know, you don't even have to think about rent uh, once you have uh, initialized the tree. The third thing, and this is probably the, diff the, the key piece that is very different about compressed NFTs, is that when you're reading an NFT, um, you're going to actually need to call it from an RPC. So you're used to, if you have worked with NFTs before, you are used to calling the RPC to retrieve token information, taking that token information, deriving some information about the token metadata, and using all of that, stitching all that together to create an NFT. Now, what has been really cool is that Metaplex built out a specification for something called the Metaplex Read API. And this is a set of RPC methods that expose new, uh, well, new methods that make all of this much simpler. So for example, there is a method called get assets by owner that if you provided an owner address, it will return you the list of all the NFTs, both compressed and uncompressed for a particular wallet. Now, this is important because with compressed NFTs, because the actual each individual NFT is not sitting in an account like uh, uh, like before, the RPC is actually reconstructing the state of the Merkle tree, reconstructing all of those leaves and keeping them in a database caching them, making it faster for this particular API call. And so you do need to use an RPC because it would take a long time to go back in time to you know trudge through all the blocks and figure out the state of a particular tree. Uh, fortunately, a, a couple of, a few of the RPCs already implement the same uh, interface, the same uh, read API. 
And so you can kind of use it interchangeably across any of the RPCs that exposes this particular um, this particular endpoint. If you're using something like simple hash, which is an NFT indexer, it just returns these compressed NFTs as if they're regular NFTs because they are just regular NFTs. Um, and the final bit, and I mentioned this before, is that whenever you need to make an update to any of the leaves, or in this case, uh, I need to update the ownership of an NFT, or if you need to update some information about the NFT, the key difference between um, uh, these trees and compressed NFTs and the, in the current state of the world is that you actually have to pass a proof. And that proof is basically just saying, hey, you know and understand the current state of the world and you are authorized to make this change. If you have both of those pieces of information, then you're allowed to make an uh, adjustment to this tree um, and it's all good. So this part you can retrieve again from the RPC. The RPC, read the read API interface provides a get asset proof uh, method that will return all of the proofs that you need to make this modification. Um, so that was a lot about compressed NFTs. I know there's likely a lot of questions. Uh, I'm going to go just a little bit farther, and then I will uh, definitely give everyone a chance to ask some questions and things like that. So what's really cool is that state compression, the thing that's underneath compressed NFTs, can be used for much more than just NFTs. So Jeff was talking about social graphs. This is exactly what we're starting to see it being used for. Gum is uh, built by the folks uh, behind WordCell. And state compression allows them to store an individual social data for life for the price of a pack of gum. It's a great tagline, but in reality, it's true. If you look at how they've constructed all of the pieces of their social graph and the way that they've used state compression, um, they can store all of that on Solana for very, very little cost, for the cost of a single transaction, for every little thing that someone does, like making a profile or reacting to something or uh, posting a comment or anything like that. So definitely uh, uh, recommend you check out GUM. Um, and uh, an S-graph uh, is a what I would consider like a front end for this. It's like a social media uh, uh, Web3 application and they use state compression as well. Uh, they're using it to compress their entire relational follow graph, their social graph, uh, putting that on chain so that they can use it in the context of other front ends. So uh, folks like Gum and SGRAF are beginning to use state compression for different use cases. And it's a really great use case for basically anything that could look like a relational database. Um, it fits really well in the state compression paradigm. So I know that was a lot. Uh, I'm gonna be able, I'm gonna share this deck with everybody. There's um, a lot of links here uh, from providers all around the ecosystem that have written about state compression. Um, including uh, here, the uh, Digital Asset RPC Infrastructure Repository, which is an open source indexer for compressed NFTs, um, as well as a white paper about concurrent Merkle trees, how they work, and what kind of guarantees we can get from them. And that's it. Oh, um, sideways. Um, John, that was amazing. <laughs> um, I'm going to turn my camera off because that might be disorienting. Um, so that was brilliant um, and incredibly informative and clear. Uh, questions, folks, um, just pop your hand and unmute yourself and ask away. Um, the, yeah, go ahead, Juan. Yep. Uh, yes, I wanted to ask uh, about the, um, like the technical limitation of this. For example, the buffers that allow the concurrent uh, modification uh, has a limit size or uh, the depth of the tree has uh, some limitation. What are the, the current technical limitation of this? Yeah, that's a, that's a good, uh, good question. So um, as, it as it relates to the configuration of the trees, uh, we do have a max depth of 30. So you can only put 1 billion things in a tree. That's a very good problem to have. Uh, there's not many things that you can make a billion of uh, yet. Um, hopefully there'll be more. But the thing is that you can always make another tree, right? So it, this is a limitation on a single tree, but there's nothing stopping you from making multiple trees. Um, the other question was around um, concurrency. So there is... Um, there, that max buffer size configuration starts at about 64, but actually goes up to 2048. 
Um, and so for applications where you expect a lot of changes to the tree, you may want 22,048 uh, uh, roots on the buffer. And what that means is that you can just have lots of out of date clients. And this is actually not too impractical if you think about it. Like, let's say that you have a um, hundred million uh, NFTs in a tree and you have, you know, let's say 10 million users or something like that. The likelihood that 2000 of them are going to make changes inside the same block, probably like reasonably high. And so, you know, you do have to design your client to make sure that it's retrieving the most up to date proofs. But even if those are slightly out of date, they will still work because of the concurrency that, that we have here. The last limitation that I think is worth pointing out is that um, is based on the Solana runtime itself, which is that Solan the Solana runtime has a compute limit attached to every writable account that is passed into a, a, a transaction. Um, and as a result, if you think about, again, the same same example where you have 100 million NFTs and 10 million users, and they're all modifying the same tree, you're going to likely hit that compute limit well before you hit the concurrency limit. And so what we suggest for that is actually to consider that your trees should look more like data partitions. So if you had 100 million NFTs, it actually makes more sense to sort of randomly distribute them over maybe 100, 1 million trees. 10, 10 million trees and add the same concurrency. And as a result, then you can really facilitate all of this sort of random access to that state without having to uh, worry about any of the account contention um, issues that might that might come up as a result. Okay, thanks. You, you're muted, Jeff. Oh, Dean, you're good. Oh, cool, cool. Yeah. Um, hey, I was just I was just wondering. Um, with the concurrent updates, uh, would I be right in assuming that the 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 way you're doing that is you're using Merkle proofs, where you just have to change the hash of the thing that you're updating, and then the pairing hashes don't change, and then you're going up to like some part of like some branch in the Merkle tree that you're storing on chain? Is that kind of how you're doing it? Uh, yeah. This is a good. Uh... This is a good question. Um, uh, sorry, I'm just uh, I'm just uh, giving you all um, viewing access to the slides that I um, that I uh, just posted. Um, yeah, so uh, the concurrency uh, basically what happens is uh, even in the case where we're not storing um, any information on chain, like the the canopy height is zero in this case. Uh, what's happening is that the proofs are getting fast forwarded. So if the proofs that were provided were valid against a previous version of the Merkle tree, like one of the previous routes, um, and it doesn't conflict with another update that happened already, uh, we can actually just fast forward it, fast forward that same proof uh, using, um, actually, I think you're right. I think there is some, some part of it that we're storing on chain and that we're using that to fast forward the proof and validate it against a newer version of the route. Right, because because my understanding, like if you if you make a Merkle if you get a Merkle tree right, and then you create a Merkle proof like similar to an SPV proof in the Bitcoin white paper, um, if you just change the thing that you're like currently working on, none of the pairing hashes actually change. Like y you could use the Merkle, you could use the thing that you updated, the hash of that, paired with all of the you know um, the Merkle leaves or branch the Merkle leaf and the Merkle branches that you would pair with to update the Merkle root without having to like, you know, recalculate the entire tree, right? But like, so I guess my question was like, yeah, what is the limitations around that concurrency? Because it would sound to me like, say you, if you had like, um, I think what's what's 64, it's two to the, is that two to the five or? Uh, two, two, two to, to the, the six. 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 Yeah. yeah. So if you had like, say like, so if you had like um, a canopy height of six, right? Then would like updating, like I could understand that you could totally concurrently update, say like all the way up to any of those branches, right? As long as there was no update on the same branch. But uh, I, is it true, would it be correct to assume you don't get concurrency around the same branch? Um, I think that it goes all, 
I don't think that there's limitations on like say like say you're updating two sibling nodes uh, in, yeah. in this balanced binary tree. I don't think that there's any restrictions there. It's mostly around um, is it's the first piece is like okay, this is validated against a particular root, um, and then the canopy height is more like a it's I, I wouldn't I wouldn't count it as part of this computation because it's more like a uh, a cache, right? It's more like a like hey, we don't want to have to communicate all this information over the wire. So I'd have to double check, but based on our last conversation, my last conversation about something very similar, like are there restrictions on say that you kept just updating the same exact path in the tree over and over and again? Like, would you brick the, um, would you brick the sort of update, uh, sorry, the, uh, the roots? I think the only case that it happens is if you were to do that um, for the size of the buffer is, is what you're getting at. But I need to double check. I, I just linked the white paper, so I would I would take a look at that and see if that helps answer your question. Uh, but yeah, I think it's a good point. And are you using what 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 hashing algorithm is it? Is it SHA fifty six? I let me double check. Dean, you're asking all these hard questions, bro. <laughs> hey, I got, I got yeah the yeah SHA yeah sh yeah SHA SHA two fifty six. Yeah. I was just wondering, like. Um, any considerations around, say, like smaller hashing algorithms like SHA-1 or RIPEMD-160 or something? I think the the main constraint that we had was around how long the bytes were uh, on chain, because I think that affected both collision rate. Um, we definitely didn't want to have collisions. And the second part was how much space it would take on chain. So we ended up picking something that was round that looked like public, like Solana public keys. Uh, but I do remember, uh, I do remember like uh, the folks discussing whether or not they should change the different meshes. Yeah, because like, you know, just thinking like, for example, like Blake 3, way more compute efficient, uh, RIPEMD160, smaller on-chain footprint. Yeah, so I was just wondering like, yeah. Yeah, I think like the constraints there would be whether or not it's available in the runtime and, and right. something that's easily accessible from a compute standpoint. One gotcha. thing that we haven't done is we haven't optimized this. Like, I, you know, we like have yeah. the thing working, the concurrency works, but I would say compute and capacity constraints, we're finding out as products build into it. And we're realizing, hey, like you can store a billion NFTs, but slightly impractical, right? Um, you, you can use one tree slightly impractical. So. I think as we explore more, um, you know, and if this is sound, sounds interesting, you should definitely dig into it and see if there's uh, potential improvements to make. Sure. Uh, do I get one more question, Jeff? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Good ones. Uh, Good. These deep, hard ones. <laughs> um, what was my final question? Oh, yes. Um, was that your question? No, it's not. <laughs> no. Um, just thinking, um, because like NFTs are typically created by some kind of an issuer, right? Or they're typically around, say, like, they're typically on some kind of, like, a marketplace. Like, let's say you could, you know, say, like, I don't know, uh, Magic Eden or something, or you could say, like, you know, some independent, like, NFT project, just as two examples, right? So, like, if you were to, instead of going straight to an RPC node, like, sign the updates to the transaction and publish it through a central-ish, not centralized, you, you could still publish direct to Ledger. But if you went through like a sort of, I don't want to say central authority, but like, I guess, like, through a single sort of source of truth, right? Could you not uh, improve the throughput of the Merkle tree updates by just having a single person process and publish them for you? Totally. Uh, yeah, you're describing a, basically an L2, right? Like uh, something, another validator system that does all of this. Uh, so this is something we thought about. So one of the constraints, actually, if we look at that cost estimate, where we look at something like 1 billion NFTs for 500 soul, actually the tree storage is a very, very minimal. It's probably 1% of the storage cost. The, uh, the rest of it, 99% of the cost at a billion is actually the number of transactions that you need to send on mainnet in order to fill that tree. So we've had to think about a couple of different problems here. One is around, can we batch mint could we just say, hey, do some off-chain work, pre-compute a root, pre-compute the root, and then publish like a data dump of like, here is the state of the tree, go download this um, instead of trying to download this from individual transactions. And if all of them verify against the root, then you know, you're basically, you know, Bob's your uncle, things are good. Um, we, we haven't figured out 
there, there's some attack vectors there. Obviously, people could just publish, you know, malicious data dumps, all that sort of stuff. But um, what that introduced was exactly what you're talking about, which is if we can initialize trees with roots, then why not use the compressed, the state compression trees with that root being a state root, right? A state root of some pre-calculated state somewhere else. So say that you wanted to build an L2 on Solana, not that you really need to, but if you wanted to, you could have that L2, just do whatever it needs to do, churn out a root, and then update the root on chain. The chain root plus the proofs that are generated from the L2, you could always use to verify against that particular uh, uh, tree. And you could always uh, use the smart contract on the L1, in this case Solana, to be able to use that proof and eject out some important state. So as long as the state compression, um, the, the thing that's wrapping the state compression program on Solana was obviously open source, verified, and, and, and could do something like eject fungible tokens, then you could use it as a state root for like an L2 or something like that. Yeah, dope. Yeah, because I was just thinking like you, like I think the biggest problem that you're probably going to run up against is like if you had something really high throughput it would probably be like concurrency. Right. And like if you had like a sort of I guess you're calling it an L2, but like I think I think it would be like a 1.5 in the sense that like you could still publish directly to chain. But if you were to go through like one person who was aggregating all these transactions, they wouldn't have to constantly hit the ledger and grab the updated like or the RPC and grab the updated state because they'd have it like sitting there because they're the one like publishing these updates. Like, yeah, I was just thinking like. Yeah, it's just like an interesting yeah, idea. Totally. Yeah, exactly. This is, I'm glad you're picking up on this. This is something that like games are actually uh, really well suited to do, where if they're the ones that are publishing these updates, the, the fact that it's on chain is sort of like a, a, a second order effect, right? They want a great experience for their gamers. And so they could build out an entire like experience, just like what you're saying, where the they can, they could be laggy. They could be a little bit laggy, right? Um, and not wait for the on-chain stuff. They can optimistically handle those confirmations, like uh, optimistically handle those updates within within their own system and provide a better experience for their gamers. Very cool. Very cool. Other questions, hey, Nate? Any other questions? I think Nate or Andrew. Anybody else? Cool. So, John, as we um, as we start to roll up our sleeves and dig into this um, this technology, what is uh, the best way for us to get questions answered, ask questions, contribute to the growth of this, uh, try to break it? <laughs> you know, the good stuff. Yeah, it's a it, that's a good question. So we have a few repos, right? So it depends on what part you're breaking. Um, uh, I put these in the slides at the very end, but there's uh, the Metaplex Foundation has the digital asset RPC infrastructure, which is the read API. That's the indexing layer. And that indexing layer, you can actually repurpose to use for the generic state compression. So that's what people are doing now. So if you have indexing things, or if you wanna use state compression for things that are not NFTs, uh, you know that's a good place to put it. Um, we have, uh, uh, you know, obviously the Solana Stack Exchange is really good. Uh, and then Twitter, you know, you can reach all of the authors uh, of the, the contracts. Um, you can reach folks like myself on Twitter. Uh, we don't quite have a Discord place yet because because there are like three or four different moving pieces. But I think it's something that will improve as as we go on. And our developer, sorry, our developer relations team at the Solana Foundation has been putting together a bunch of resources on, uh, you know, SDKs, um, being able to estimate you know, storage for trees, storage costs. Um, there's also a very cool site, and this is not this is not um, not public, but I'll I'll drop you some fun a fun little project for you that Devrel put together, which is called One Million NFTs dot page. So if you're familiar with the one min the one million dollar front page or one million dollar page, where someone was selling in individual pixels on the page for a dollar each. Um, this is a canvas of a million pixels that you can mint as compressed NFTs. We promise we won't charge you a dollar for it, but uh, wanted to show off the tech. So if you wanted to, uh, if you have the Phantom multi-chain beta, um, you can uh, you can actually do this on any wallet, by the way. You can mint anything on any wallet, but only some wallets right now have support for reading them. Uh, 
if you don't if you don't yet have the um, the multi chain beta, I'll just give you a code here for Phantom, uh, and you can um, see the results of minting that particular pixel uh, in inside of your wallet. Awesome. So um, this is maybe a little bit of a tangent, but since we have a few minutes here, um, I was curious on the off-chain off -chain storage component. Um, maybe you touch base on this. Are you, are you familiar with the project DJIV or JIV that's popped up on Solana recently? They're, they're an on-chain storage solution that's launching on, on Solana natively. Um, and they're kind of, seems like a shoe in for a lot of this data for NFT compression is gonna be stored off-chain, but what if this was stored somewhat off chain but on chain and, and a decentralized data storage component you kind of solve the immutability problem of data right but any thoughts on yeah. that yeah this is a good question we have gone back and forth as to what we define as on chain or off chain so very like the most obvious one is like an account on solana is definitely on chain right right now what what about the ledger right ledger information is not accessible in the context of a smart contract but it is recreatable by replaying that particular block, replaying that particular transaction. Is that on chain? I was questioning this, but I actually totally believe so. So I if totally believe so. You know, I'll I'll I'll, I'll let it go, right? <laughs> um, and so I think there is this misconception that like the actual uh, uh, NFT like leaf data, the actual metadata. Um, and this is not the off-chain JSON part. This is just like the, the base level Correct. information that would get used in the context of the smart contract is fully off-chain. It's only, it's on-chain in the ledger. And so it is already uh, a sort of decentralized and accessible to as many people as, as uh, run, the, run the network. Um, and so that part of it, I don't think we would, um, that part of it, you know, I'm pretty proud of like putting into the ledger. Yeah. So I'd have to see what this particular project is. Uh, to to see how those things coincide, but if there's a way to link everything together, yeah, that'd be great. I'm thinking the JSON files, right? Having having that link in the metadata to an on-chain data storage component kind of fully syncs that circle, right? And then you completely totally. you completely solve that data immutability problem with compressed data, and then you've got a rock solid base to run off of. Yeah, I completely agree. I think that there uh, is definitely room for a new specification around that URI field. Uh, to make the URI field a resolve to an account or a set of accounts. Um, and that way, uh, wallets and other providers could uh, make those RPC calls and like, right. you know, just finish that entire loop. Yeah, no, awesome, awesome. Thanks for that. Cool. Any others? Well, John, this has been beyond my uh, expectations. Just you know, your your ability to present this in a very digestible way, and and thanks everybody who asked really good questions because those are the ones that um, usually manifest some additional great nuggets of information. Um, so, oh, there you go. Um, so, thank you. Uh, we'll we'll look forward to you know staying in touch and contributing and and benefiting from this and all for the benefit of of Solana and its growth and and the future. Um, if, yep. And if um, if anybody has any questions or needs to get in touch or wants to break stuff, uh, let me know. If you can't directly do that, we'll get you that support. And next up this afternoon, we have economics design coming to talk about Web3 economics, tokenomic, and building out that part of a project. So that should be a pretty cool session. Um, give it up for John. Show him some Thanks emoji. Woohoo! And um, oh, Andrew, you have, oh, Andrew, did you mean to ask a question or do, were you trying to do an emoji? Call emoji. <laughs> Awesome. All right, John. Thanks a lot, brother. And everybody you, have Samantha. a great day. We'll see you soon. Bye. Bye. See ya, bro. See y'all.